you very much, uh, Asha. <clears throat> and uh, what a, uh, an honour to, to be here today and um, in this sort of company, um, seeing so many familiar faces. And uh, if we all have a love of meditation, well, one way of looking at that is we have a love of uh, sitting around and doing nothing and just being still, and that's very close to my heart, just ask my wife, um, Deirdre, so... Uh, but um, it's, it's more than just nothing, and uh, so it's great to be here. I think it's uh, the world needs uh, meditation enormously. I'm going to give a, a few thoughts on why I think that is so and, and its connection with peace. And funnily enough, the very first thing I had written here that I wanted to say very much follows on from the words, well, the beautiful words of Sister Jayanti. Um, so we all crave peace, I think, and I think the main reason for that is that, that it's uh, an indelible part of our nature. Uh, the very fact that it's, it's indelible in our nature means that uh, there's a yearning for it when, uh, when we lack it. Uh, probably the most um, uh, respected and famous award in the world uh, these days is the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, because it's something that we all value so much. And even in the things that we deeply want and, uh, or fear, um, and that create a lot of agitation and anxiety for us, uh, what we most desire is the peace that comes from the attainment or the avoidance of those things, like a, a bringing back to some kind of stability. But what is peace? Um, well, uh, you can always go to the dictionary and uh, one definition, a state or period in which there is no war or a war has ended. Uh, I don't think that's true peace. Uh, it's uh, generally either a suppression or just a remission in conflict. Um, there are a lot of such wars, and not just wars between nations, class wars, battles of the sexes, racial tensions, war on drugs, etc. Um, but it's just an outer state. Um, that a couple ceases arguing doesn't mean that there's peace in the household. Uh, the second definition that was there, freedom from disturbance, tranquility. And I think this is a lot closer to the real meaning of it, this inner state. Um, not an outer one, although the outer one will be an expression of the inner state, whether it's the individual <clears throat> or the society. It implies a lack of conflict, a lack of tension, and an inner state of harmony. So to know what um, the way to peace, well, I think we need to understand what disturbs the peace, to know what the origins of conflict are. And perhaps meditation can teach us a lot about that. So what's the cause of conflict? Well, I think if we look within ourselves, we'll probably discover that. Um, if peace is an indelible part of our nature, uh, and we therefore yearn to reconnect with it, then the causes of conflict uh, perhaps have become second nature. And that is um, learned, conditioned, or socialised into us. And this sort of peace within of, is very much expressed in the peace without. So. To quote um, Plato, that the nature of a state, if you like, or a society is just a reflection of the nature of the people within it. We cannot suppose that states are made of oak and rock and not out of the human natures which are in them. But if we understand the cause of conflict within ourselves, we might gain some insights into the causes of conflict uh, within and between individuals and societies. So when we look within, say, during meditation, what do we find? Now, I won't ask for any confessions here, but um, perhaps, perhaps you find a busy mind. I don't know if any of you have ever had a busy mind, but this is not autobiographical, but this is perhaps a representation of what many of us might find when we sit to meditate, perhaps a, a busy mind. When we look at it closely, we might find it the mind revolving around an imaginary me, doing, living an imaginary future or reliving an imaginary past or having imaginary conversations. Anybody ever come across that during your meditation? Not unified, not at peace. There's a modern science around all this called default mental activity that's circling around an ego full of wants and fears, opinions, contradictions, daydreams, criticisms, conflicts, worries, ruminations, and that's probably on a good day. All right, so... What, and, but the questions I put to you, which I often reflect on myself, what is this me in the mind? Uh, who or what is watching it? And which of these am I? 
Am I the one that is under observation or the one observing? Uh, wisdom traditions have got a lot to say, a lot of insights into the causes of mental agitation. Uh, they talk about things like desire and attachments, not just to objects and possessions, a car, a, you know, clothes, a, a house, etc. Our opinions, uh, I don't know if anybody here holds any opinions. It implies there's a deep attachment. No, probably not. But, uh, or maybe you've had a conversation with somebody else who holds a different opinion. And two people having a strong attachment to a point of view then becomes a tug of war. There's inevitably going to be conflict arising out of that rather than two people considering the merits of a particular point of view, for example, which is a lot easier to happen if people aren't attached to that point of view. But also all the characteristics that were being spoken of, the you know, race and uh, gender, etc. So all of these things are, are there, but um, there's certainly a deep attachment and identification with these things. But out of this comes a creation of a me and a mine. Um, <clears throat> and wherever that arises, there's a potential for separation and conflict <coughs> with the other. Um, and there are various levels of uh, me and mine, from the individual to my family, my social grouping, my city, my state, my country, my culture, always a me and a mine, which implies, of course, there's a you and a yours. And uh, it's not just individual characteristics as well, nations, uh, po politics, ideology, the car we drive, the football team we barrack for, we probably better not go into that. There'll be a lot of tension if we do, a lot of conflict, but uh, the universe we, university we go to, the food we eat, there can be this me and mine. And of course, social media is really fanning those flames these days, These uh, um, this sort of potential for in-group and out-group. There's a creation wherever there's a me and a mine, it implies there's an other. Uh, there's an in-group where there's similarity and then where there's difference, there is other. Um, Albert Einstein de described it as a, an optical delusion of our consciousness. Uh, he was much more than a physicist, I think. Uh, he said many, many wise things. But this sort of, this universal view all of a sudden gets closed down to some small circle. But he spoke also about um, the way out of that, this sort of prison uh, that we live in, in our own minds. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. I think more than just a physicist. Uh, the effect of this optical delusion is to project onto the other and stop seeing them or hearing them to separate from them, to stop caring about them. So they matter less <clears throat> uh, and we're only concerned more for um, the outcomes for me or for mine. With that reference point, that sort of closed off reference point, limited reference point, there's little potential for compassion or common humanity or authentic connection with the other. Our interactions become very tra transactional. Uh, what's in it for me, for example? And in this sort of, this rise of this, and in, to some extent this sort of polarisation uh, leaves enormous room for conflict in the world. So, and, and this I guess is the challenge, how do we transcend this? Now wisdom traditions have also had a lot to say uh, about um, not just giving examples of people who transcended these kinds of limitations um, and uh, to expand to something far bigger. Uh, there are lots of examples in Christianity, um, Christ on the cross, the, the story of the Good Samaritan in Buddhism, the cultivation of compassion in the Indian philosophic tradition, the Advaita Vedanta uh, tradition, where Advaita is a word, ah, uh, and Dwaita not two, which means one, uh, the philosophy of oneness or unity. It's there in all of the world's great wisdom traditions we could go on. Um, so the, the wisdom is there, but there are certainly modern day examples of people who really live this in their lives. Uh, extraordinary people who I, I think, whenever I read what they've got to say, tend to say that they're not extraordinary, they're just like everybody else, but just perhaps realised something that uh, perhaps <clears throat> had been covered or uh, something that they're able to draw from themselves. 
And many of these people, of course, have won Nobel Peace Prizes as well. Mother Teresa, whoever she served and cared for, she saw as a part of herself and no more or less worthy than anybody else. Mahatma Gandhi, um, the Dalai Lama, a, a quote from him, Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. <clears throat> or the great Nelson Mandela, who was extraordinary, 27 years in a prison cell, and to come out and be a force for justice for all, not for <clears throat> only um, his kind, for example, but for all. And Bill Clinton tells a story about meeting Mandela and, um, uh, and having a conversation with him after his inauguration. And, uh, <clears throat> come on, you are a great man. You invited your jailers to your inauguration. You put your pressures on the government. But tell me the truth. Weren't you really angry all over again? And Mandela said, yes, I was angry and I was a little afraid. After all, I'd not been free for so long. But when I felt that anger well up inside of me, I realised that if I hated them after I got outside that gate, um, then they would still have me. And he smiled and said, I wanted to be free, so I let it go. Extraordinary. I, I never realised that he had actually spent a lot of time meditating in his prison cell. I suspect he could have come out of that cell in a very different way if he hadn't had that time to really find the core of his being, which of course is common to everybody, including his jailers. Uh, it's extraordinary. Um, and it was interesting too, at the inauguration, uh, one of the prayers that was recited at that uh, is a Sanskrit prayer, um, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, which translates as, may all be happy. Uh, or the wise before her, uh, he is Malala Yousafzai. I truly believe that the only way we can create global peace is through not only educating our minds, but our hearts and souls. Um, so what is the solution? How do we educate our hearts and souls? There's one way that's very direct and simple, but as I often say, is not easy. Um, so simple is a different thing, I think, to easy, which uh, is finding peace within through meditation. As we practice, we will likely come to face to face with the causes of conflict, uh, agitation, separation, anger, fear, anxiety, and that's what we're working with. We can welcome it in. It's not as if it's not meant to be there. If it turns up, it turns up. But that's what we're working with. So learning to work with it. And meditation provides us the opportunity to stop feeding it and reinforcing it. And in due course, hopefully, to be free of this prison cell that we create within our own minds and hearts. Um, made up of fears, imaginings, attachments, uh, and conditioning. I think if we're patient, and I think patience is required here, that meditation can help us to surrender the constant reference to me and mine, to be present and to come out of the imaginary past and the future, uh, to use reason to wisely manage or learn to not to be controlled by emotions and appetites that don't always uh, do us or the, or the world very well and not by being in conflict with them, but learning through non-attachment not to be controlled by them. And to cultivate compassion even in the face of things which we may dislike or find very uncomfortable. And ultimately, I think the most important thing is to find that essence of our being uh, and the ground uh, of our being, which is common to all, which is the, the, the ground for common humanity by ceasing to identify with the superficialities that we are not which is not to deny their presence, but if we forget that unity amidst the diversity, then we miss the most important thing. And I think that through this practice, we might discover the true meaning of the golden rule, which is really at the heart of all the world's great wisdom traditions to treat others as oneself. The golden rule, I think, only really makes sense if there is no other because the other is oneself. So in closing, I'd like to invoke um, that which is written at the end of many Sanskrit prayers, uh, Shanti, 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 uh, may peace and peace and peace be everywhere. Thank you very much for your attention.